Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, buenos dias, buenas tardes, welcome. I'm Rosa Lazardi. I am the Global Director of the Feminist Task Force. And on behalf of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development and my colleague Emilia Reyes from Equidad de Genero, who is in the background, we welcome you to today's webinar, The Care and Labor Rights Challenges from the Capitalistic Pandemic. This webinar is part of a series called Macro Solutions for Women, the People and the Planet, which we're presenting to delve into the systemic dynamics that have undermined the well being of women, their families, and communities. All peoples and the planet. We began this series covering the financial and gender impacts of COVID. And as you all know, COVID has colored our world in various shades of grays and darks. We have weaved that analysis into the following webinars, looking at the macro and gender dimensions of debt, tax, trade and intellectual property, climate, climate finance, exploring these things for feminist solutions and specific proposals of campaigns and action-oriented solutions, uh, as well as key priorities and key messaging. Each session aims to present the structural points of entry for a specific issue. And today's is on care and labor rights. Challenges from the capitalist pandemic, which our colleague Corina Rodriguez, who is on the panel has coined. And we are thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Dawn longtime partners in collective thinking, feminist analysis, and coalition building. John was one of the founders of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. So we're very <laughs> happy to be partnering with them. And I want to invite my longtime friend um, who precedes, our friendship precedes the Women's Working Group, Alejandra Scampini of Dawn, to say a few welcoming words as well. Alejandra. Thank you very much, Rosa. Uh, I am here in Uruguay. I am associated with Dawn. I'm here giving you a warm welcome um, from the Global South on behalf of Dawn. And we are, as Rosa was saying, very happy because we have been at the foundation moments of the Women Working Group on Financing for Development back in the times of Monterrey Conference. And um, our dear Gigi Francisco, was the one leading that process so it's you know it's it's natural that we are here also today and uh, for us this is also a very important moment for this conversation thank you emilia and rosa for engaging don in this we also believe in the call that the women working group is doing for um thinking about multilateralism changing multilateralism from a feminist perspective and specifically on the issue that we are Topping, uh, we are tapping today, care and labor. John has been also doing a series of, of talks. Um, I'm gonna also put the, the link to a series of talks that we have been doing on the terrible impacts of COVID uh, that have been you know, happening around the world, showing you know, the enormous setbacks and deepening pre-existing inequalities and exposing vulner vulnerabilities um, in social, political and economic systems. And so um, tomorrow there will be also a conversation on this. So it's, it's gonna be part of the series of conversation. And also we are uh, in a confluencia feminista, uh, thinking uh, of feminist alternatives. So we, we see this work on local, regional, and, and global level with you. And thank you very much for joining and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Ale, and thank you for paying homage to Gigi Francisco. We remember her, keep her in our thoughts. Um, so let me again thank you all for, for being here. I am going to turn over to our moderator, Maureen Bushman, who's the Senior Advocacy and Policy Advisor for Women's Economic Empowerment at CARE International, um, who are our partners now in the Generation Equality Action Coalition. So we're thrilled to be working with you, Maureen, um, in these various spaces. Thank you and take it over. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rosa, for the lovely introduction. Thanks, Alejandra, for um, setting up this amazing webinar. And welcome to all of you. We're so thrilled to have this discussion with you today, an important debate on the challenges from the capitalist pandemic. Um, it's a series, as Rosa said. Today's um, focus is on care and labor rights. And um, I'll be uh, moderating the discussion. I'm uh, Maureen Bushman. I work for Care International in the UK, based in London, and I'm focusing on women's economic empowerment, which looks at um, financial inclusion, economic opportunity, dignified work, and also some of the macroeconomic challenges that we face. And um, I think um, just before we get started, a note on if you want to like um, join the debate, please do that um, on YouTube. You can also um, use Twitter and uh, tweet under the hashtag feminist demands and carrot center. Um, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to the debate. Just to kick off, us off, I think we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women and girls. Um, it has laid bare and reinforced the structural inequalities that women and girls face and um, also impacts their ability to realize economic uh, justice and rights. CARE has done some research around that um, and found that COVID, and I think that's not a revelation, could condemn women to decades of poverty and really puts at risk all the progress we've achieved in the past and um, really laid bare the, the existing structural inequalities. Today, we're going to focus on three aspects of that. So we, we know that um, unpaid care work is a really strong barrier to women's economic justice and rights. And women and girls do um, three times more domestic and unpaid care work than men do. We know that the economic downturn triggered by COVID particularly affects women who are working in informal and domestic jobs, which offer little pay and offer no legal or social protection. And we also know that women face a much higher inf infection risk due to the work they do, like in the global health and social care workforce, and that they're also more exposed to other rights issues. We've seen an increase in gender-based violence, which the UN Secretary General has described as a shadow pandemic. So it's a really complex picture. And um, all of that obviously leads to women's access to economic and financial opportunities decreasing. And we can see a violation of, of rights. And um, as I said, we're at risk of losing decades of progress achieved. And we're seeing the lessons from COVID, which really show that the current economic and financial system is gender inequitable. Um, we'd like to use today's webinar as an opportunity to look forward and look at some of the solutions, discuss some of the messages and um, potential yeah, remedies to, to get it right and build back better, that's the slogan, right? Um, or more equal and more just, and really look at how can we tackle those structural inequalities here with a link to labor's rights and the care economy and social protection. How can we bring in a gender lens throughout this economic response and prioritize women and girls in, in the response? And also how can we elevate women's leadership in, in shaping recovery. And um, just to say one thing more, um, CARE has done research that really shows that if women are co-leading the response, it leads to more equitable results, yet women are largely absent from discussions around recovery and the COVID response. So um, that said, um, let's get back to our topic today and focus in on care and labor rights. Um, looking at um, solutions and we've got an amazing panel of experts. I'm really looking forward to an inspiring and engaging debate with, with all of you. And um, we're going to start with a panel discussion will be kicked off by Corina Rodriguez Enriquez, um, who is the executive executive committee member of DAWN and also a researcher at the National Council of Scientific Research in Buenos Aires. And um, Corina is an expert on feminist economics and has focused on a range of issues from social and fiscal policies, labor market, 
poverty, income distribution, and the care economy. Um, after that, um, we're going to hear from Shara Razavi, um, working at the ILO. I'm going to introduce her later, um, focusing on social protection. Then she'll be joined uh, by Laura Alphas, working at Vigo, also on social protection and in informal employment. And then we'll hear a response from Nancy Kachingwe, um, working at South Feminist Alternatives, trying to join the dots for us and um, kick off the discussion. But let's start with you, Corina, and um, a presentation on um, unpaid care work. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks uh, to the Women's Working Group on FFD for inviting them to be part of this conversation. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to, to be sharing this panel with these great colleagues. Um, so yes, I want to bring to this conversation some thoughts on care issues uh, that I believe uh, have have gained new and larger dimensions in this in this context. Um, I think that the first thing that it has been very very it has been made very very clear is that care is a systemic issue. Uh, the pandemic has exposed with uh, I, I may say with cruelty that care work both paid and unpaid supports life and supports the system. Uh, the care systemic role has been made uh, as visible as ever, as supporting the, the stay at home uh, uh, imperative to face the pandemic, but, but also as being in the very front line. Uh, um, health workers are, are the, the main example of this. Uh, and it has also been made very visible that care work is still women's work not only within the households, but more broadly, broadly within the communities and within the economy. The, the second issue regarding care, I think, is the precariousness of, of care work. Uh, within households, care work is unpaid, is excessive, is non-ending, uh, has no social protection. And paid care work is low paid, is informal, is risky, in both cases, care work is still very, very much devalued. And I think the third issue that has also become very clear in this context of pandemic is that care arrangements uh, are a locus of inequality reproduction. Inequality has also been made as visible as ever in this context. Uh, the possibilities to, to apply sound strategies to face the pandemic uh, proved to be different for rich and poor countries and for rich and poor people, for rich and poor households. The situation of people living in poor areas, in slums, in big cities, uh, the situation of migrant population uh, is also uh, very shocking visible these days. So I think that if we want to escape from the pandemic capitalism, uh, we need to revert inequalities from their very, very roots. Uh, so in this context, I think that the feminist care agenda becomes more essential than ever. Uh, but I also think that we need to review it in light of the new challenges that we face. Uh, I understand that the multiple R's that we link to the care issues are, are, are still needed, recognize, reduce, redistribute, reward, represent. And many of these R's claims for, for public policies. Uh, the, the pandemic has also made it uh, clear the importance of uh, having active states and that uh, when there is political will, resources uh, are there in a way or another. So I think part of this conversation also needs us to, to tackle the issue of who and how should pay for care provisioning. Uh, and reallocation of resources for care policies should be part of the, of the uh, redistributive agenda. So taxes and illicit financial flows are also care issues. And uh, I think we should also reflect about uh, what policies, what care policies. Uh, is our traditional set of care policies, the one that we have been demanding for long, uh, still the right one? Uh, I, I, I would say that care policies need to be comprehensive, diverse, 
flexible. They, they need to be flexible, for example, to easily adapt uh, to, to this type of, of emergencies as the one that we are living today. Uh, care policies need to be situated locally in the territories and adapted to the multiple needs and also the multiple, the multiple desires of, of people. Um, I think that the, the model of, of care policies or, or, or of a different care organization uh, that, we, that we dream about is one that redistributes responsibilities and expands possibilities for choosing what care arrangements we want to have. And we need care policies uh, to be more articulated with community-based care arrangements. Uh, so I think we also need to reflect about how can care policies support care arrangements that are already in place at the community level, uh, while at the same time challenge the precariousness and the feminization of those arrangements. So how can care policies be informed by care arrangements at the, at the community level and can be nurtured by it? Uh, and my last uh, uh, point uh, has to do with uh, how we can uh, locate care at the center of this, uh, this building back better. I would say, let's not build back, let's build forward, let's uh, not try to get a new normal, let's be abnormal if normality was what we have before. Uh, and I think the, the, the location of care in these strategies uh, needs to be very clear. Uh, so we might wonder uh, what are the care components of the uh, stimulus package, of the recovering packages. And I would say these packages should uh, uh, include investment in social infrastructure and social provision and as very priority areas, better housing, universal access to running water, to energy, to public transport can make care arrangements much, much easier. Um, and also we can think about care as an economic sector that might help to, to the recovery. And for that, we need to su support and create care jobs and make them professional, well-paid, social protected, uh, and including domestic work. Uh, and, and finally, I think that uh, we need to think about care as a social responsibility and, and as care in the center as a way to build a, a different economy, uh, to build an economy that cares for people, that serve people and not the other way around. And for that, we also need, and this is my last point, we also need to democratize uh, economic decision making and make participation of women and, and, and the, the diverse community much more present in those processes of economic decision making. Thank you. Awesome. Mute. Thank you very much, Karina, um, for this uh, great presentation and starter to get us thinking about how to address the challenges of the unpaid and paid care economy. Um, I really liked your point about this um, being so complex and needing to be a mix of government policies and community arrangements to deal with that. And I think there is something in there about also needing to shift norms, right, um, to, to share it um, out a bit more equitably and be a bit more flexible. Um, you've mentioned um, some thoughts on government policies to address um, the care economy and um, mentioned social infrastructure and investment in that and creating care jobs. I wonder um, whether you have anything to add um, on government uh, policies you would recommend or maybe also something to add on the community dimension you've referred to. Yes, I think in this uh, uh, emergency context, uh, care, uh, care arrangement at the community level has been very key to, to support everyday life of people. Uh, and they have always been there. They have been made very visible in this context. So my, my thinking on, on this is that uh, governments need to look at those arrangements and not try to replace them uh, to overlap them with uh, public policies, but instead to articulate public policies with those arrangements, while at the same time helping to change the, the, the future of those, those arrangements that uh, uh, 
put the burden on, on women's uh, on women's work and, and keep that work in a very very precarious condition. Uh, that's why I think we need to review the the usual uh, set of policies that we we always claim for of course i think we still need to push for uh, parental leaves we still need to push for and very clearly for uh, accessible uh, public care services that's very very important especially in countries in the south if we want to fight inequality, universal access to care services is very important. But those services that should be supported uh, by public policies should also be articulated with care, local uh, care arrangements uh, and should learn about how those arrangements uh, are, are benefiting uh, people the most. Thank you very much um, for kicking us off. And we can already see some great questions in the chat box. Please keep them coming. We're now going to move on to the second um, speaker, Shara Razavi. Um, it's a pleasure to have you join this panel today. Shara is the director of the Social Protection Department um, at the International Labour Organization based in Geneva. Um, she joined in February this year. Um, before that, she worked for your and women as chief of uh, research and data and uh, before that also worked at Un uh, UNRIST uh, on gender, social policy and care. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here today, Shara, over to you. Great. <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening everyone and thank you very much Maureen for that introduction. Um, thanks to Rosa and Ale uh, as uh, our organizers for having this panel and I'm totally thrilled to be here and to be sharing this panel with such distinguished uh, panelists. Um, uh, it was great to hear Corinna and I look forward to hearing other colleagues, uh, Laura and Nancy in particular. So let me, uh, I mean already I think Corinna has got us started on a really um, important uh, and high note about the way in which we need to think about sort of the care economy and women's rights and uh, social rights within that context. Let me try and bring in a bit more the themes around uh, labor and social protection into this discussion, but without, of course, forgetting about a lot of what she said about care and also touching on the issues around financing as well, which I believe is something that um, you know we're thinking about in, in this context. So um, just let me begin by saying maybe a word or two about uh, this particular crisis we're in, which in many ways is very different from other crises that we have seen over the past decades, and in particular compared to, let's say, the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, the origin of this particular crisis was not, if you if you would like to put it that way, it was not within the hyper-globalized financial markets, um, at, which are very much at the center of the global capitalist system. But in a way, the crisis erupted in the health and environment kind of underbelly that underpins the capitalist market economy. Nevertheless, the COVID-19 pandemic has very quickly kind of morphed into an economic crisis on, uh, as we know, quite significant proportions because of the lockdown measures that many governments uh, put in place to save as many lives as possible. And that combination of these lockdown measures and slowdowns that happened, uh, the combination of supply and demand shocks that Brought, were brought onto the economy, as we know, have been disastrous in terms of people's livelihoods and in terms of jobs. Uh, so unlike the financial crisis, which was a kind of came in from the demand side, this particular crisis was really um, a combination of both supply side and demand side um, shocks. And the effects, uh, however, of these massive labor market disruptions have been anything but equal. Uh, we know that class, gender and racial inequalities in this context are really um, at great risk of being magnified. So against the kind of backdrop of gender inequalities that already existed in labor markets, uh, and when I talk about labor markets, I don't just mean formal labor, I mean formal and informal labor markets. Um, we already know that there were very significant gender inequalities in labor markets. This crisis, however, has disproportionately affected women workers. Uh, and I'm going to highlight sort of four different ways in which women have been disproportionately affected. 
First of all, when we look at the data that um, I think the ILO has been very meticulously putting forward in the ILO monitor, which has come out since um, the beginning of the crisis, we see that a larger proportion of women are working in sectors which are severely affected by the crisis. Uh, so globally, about uh, 510 million people, or 40% of all employ employed women, are working in the sectors that have been very badly hit by this crisis. This includes things like accommodation and food services, wholesale and retail trade, and manufacturing. Compared to, so about 40% of all employed women are in sectors that have been very badly affected, compared to about 36% of employed men who are in these badly hit sectors. So there we see a difference. But if you look beyond the global averages, if you look behind those averages, there are some regions, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Southern Europe, are the three regions where the gender gaps are even bigger between women and men. So women much more in the sectors that have been badly hit. That's one, one fact. Secondly, what is equally worrying is that the gender gap in the proportion of informal workers who are in the heart heat sectors is also um, far greater. So more women uh, who are in the sectors that have been badly affected are working under informal labor relations compared to men. 42% of women are working informally in these badly hit sectors compared to something like 32% of men. Uh, what does this mean? What this means is that among those who are at risk of losing their jobs because their sectors have been very badly hit, they are in sectors that are badly affected, and therefore are at risk of losing hours of work or losing their jobs completely, women face a much greater risk of income insecurity because they're more likely to be informally employed. And therefore, they have little or no access to social protection. In concrete terms, what this means is that they have no income replacement in case of sickness or lockdown or if they lose their jobs and they have no, therefore have no access to unemployment benefits. So therefore, they are very um, income insecure, much more so than men. Uh, and to illustrate that, let me, let me just give you a figure about um, domestic workers. What we know is that something like 55 million or 72.3% of domestic workers around the world have been at significant risk of losing their jobs and incomes as a result of these lockdown measures and lack of effective social security coverage. Now, we know that the vast majority of this number, about 37 million, are um, uh, of these at-risk domestic workers are women. And the fact that most many of the domestic workers are also migrants also exacerbates their vulnerability because they're even less likely than at least nationals to have access to social protection um, in, in the destination countries where they're working. Third point, again, about uh, the sort of uh, labor market issues. Now, as many have said, um, this crisis has in a way revalorized, in public discourse at least, the work of so-called essential workers. That term has become very um, sort of uh, visible in this crisis. And uh, we know that these workers have continued to work despite the risk to their own health and despite the stress that comes with the long hours of work that they have been doing. And a very significant proportion of essential workers are, are the care workers. Now here we know that the overwhelming majority, more than 70% of workers, workers in health and social sector uh, are, um, who are working in jobs that entail very high levels of personal contact, you know, face-to-face -face contact with others, and therefore are facing very high risk of infection. The bulk of these are women. They experience very long hours of work, lack of uh, personal protective equipment and other resources, and also understaffing because of the years of austerity that preceded this crisis, which have left these sectors very weak, underinvested, and the staff of them, you know, very overstretched. The irony, I think, of public praise uh, and applause for care workers, which we have all seen, uh, of course, um, is coming with in tandem with persistent wage penalties and gravely inadequate working conditions. Uh, I think that's something which is not lost on anyone, this ir irony of praising them and at the same time we know that they work under very bad conditions and also first uh, face very significant wage penalties. 
Um, now, whether the pandemic will trigger a stronger organization among these workers uh, and contestation for better pay is something that we have to wait and see. And also we know that because of the crisis and disruptions in paid care services, for example, for older people, for young children, you know, a lot of the work has fallen back on uh, families and we know that much of that is on, uh, for women, meaning that their unpaid care load has increased and this again is also another constraint that stands in women's way in terms of being able to access jobs and incomes and enjoy any kind of economic autonomy and socially or economic rights. Now, let me take these four factors together and then say a few words about social protection. The story of social protection so far in some ways has been very extraordinary because we've seen a huge number of measures that have been put in place by countries around the world. The ILO Social Protection Monitor tracks the, the measures that have been taken and in the last count which came up about two weeks ago, something like 1,200 social protection measures have been put in place around the world in, to respond to this crisis. So governments are there, they haven't disappeared, uh, they're very much there. They have put in place measures in the health area and also by extending coverage of social protection to groups that were not covered before, like informal workers, migrants, and in some cases they've removed conditionalities and made it easier for people to access um, for example, cash transfers without having to jump through a lot of hurdles. But there are three major concerns that still remain and are very major concerns, I would like to say. One is that many of these measures, most of these measures are short-term measures. They're not meant to last for very long. They're only there for a very short period. Um, and that's, I think, a significant fact in the context when this crisis is not going to go away after three or four months. It's likely to have long lasting implications. The other point is that the crisis has shown major gaps in social protection systems, especially in the areas like sickness benefits, unemployment benefits, and paid care leave. We've seen that there are major gaps and millions and millions of women and men around the world don't have access to these benefits. I'm not going to go through the data, but the numbers are there. And also we've seen that a lot of the public health services uh, and also long-term care services are badly underinvested in, understaffed and, uh, and in and dire straits. So despite, however, and this is my third proviso, despite the spate of measures that have been adopted and most of them being temporary, we really need to see much longer term uh, uh, investments. And this is where we hit the really major issue, which is around the financing. Now, developing countries so far have spent much less than high income countries to tackle the crisis. The high income countries, as we know, have thrown away the old rule books about you know, limits on deficit financing. They've put in place really significant stimulus measures. Uh, but when you look at the amount of money that has been spent, about 10 trillion US dollars, in terms of developing countries, how much they have been able to mobilize domestically, it's less than 0.05% of this money has been mobilized in low-income countries. So the bulk of these stimulus measures have been mobilized in high-income countries, which are very wisely using this money in order to protect their people and to get their economies out of recession. International financial institutions and development cooperation agencies have announced various financial packages to help governments tackle the impacts of the crisis. But on, on our latest count in June of this year, so just last month, these institutions have pledged, have pledged about 1.3 trillion US dollars but as we also see is that by, by June of this year, only a very small share of the total pledges uh, have been effectively approved and allocated to support countries in the area of health and social protection. So only about 46.9 billion. Um, so a, a much larger sum is required and has been pledged than actually allocated. And the other thing we need to consider is this money that is being allocated by the IFIs, IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank and others. Um, much of this is in terms of loans that have to be repaid. And the question really is what kind of policy conditionalities are going with these loans? That's a question that we need to delve in much, much more carefully and much deeper. So let me just, just try and sort of wrap up with three points. I think on social protection, we do stand at a very critical juncture. 
countries with more comprehensive social protection systems and those that have invested or will be investing are much better placed to respond to the immediate crisis and to bounce back um, and be able to recover much better because we know that social transfers have multiplier effects on the economy and uh, they can help countries and people really bounce back from the crisis. Investing in public health services and care services is the other urgent task that can meet care needs and also provide decent employment opportunities and uh, stimulate employment creation, so a major issue. But with debt levels rising and fiscal austerity looming large, uh, which we know is going to come sooner or later as debt levels go up, we really do stand at a very delicate juncture. And, and it would be very premature to now start cutting back on the budgets when the economies are still in, in recession. But that's something we need to watch. And finally, I think this means moving from the kind of emergency responses that we have seen to long-term systems building. We need much better resource mobilization that is equitable, that has solidarity built into it through things like wealth taxes and progressive income taxes, taxes on multinational corporations, um, to be able to really build the kind of global economic and financial architecture that would also enable developing countries to invest in social protection systems. And there are very important debates going on now about debt uh, cancellation, about SDRs and so forth. And I think the kind of job rich recovery that the ILO talks about, which is what we would like to see, where income support measures are sustained to protect against deepening poverty and inequality, and where accumulated deficits are addressed in a prudent and human-centered way is the way to go. So we really have to make sure that we don't let this crisis go to waste. We have to seize the political and policy momentum that's created by the COVID pandemic to build collectively financed, comprehensive and universal social protection and care systems. Only then I think we can be sure that our societies and economies will be able to weather this particular crisis and also the many crises that unfortunately are likely to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, a, a, yeah, great presentation and um, showing also the difference between the social protection measures um, that and response uh, that has been happening um, short term, longer term, outlining some of the major gaps. Uh, I really liked your point about um, that this crisis um, hasn't uh, impacted um, people around the world equally, that it's different across regions and that there are also intersecting inequalities. You've mentioned race and gender and class and uh, women workers being particularly affected. Um, so uh, from the care a programmatic experience we've we've seen that over a million garment workers overnight lost their jobs in bangladesh and like most of them women and um yeah they slipped through safety nets there wasn't any uh, protection in place and um building on your um presentation and expertise i wonder whether you have a recommendation for us on how to set up the system in the longer term, you mentioned longer term social protection measures, that it's really taking into account the real value of work and uh, taking into account essential workers, some of the more feminist workforces. Um, do you have a quick reply? I'm sure it's not a quick reply, but um, how to set up the system in the longer term to, to capture those who slip through safety nets? Mm. Well, I think for a start, we should stop having safety nets because safety nets are not safe. We need social protection floors that are solid, that are you know a real foundation on which to build a system. I think safety nets are full of holes and that's the problem. Uh, I think we need universal systems that are strong, uh, that everyone contributes to and everyone has a stake in. Um, and that's why I think the whole idea of a universal social protection system is something that, you know, at least, at least even if it is in rhetoric, you know, a lot of agencies has come or have come around and there is a universal consensus, if I can say, around the importance of the universality in these um, social protection systems. Um, and building systems, uh, you know, what is what is obviously going to be very important, the financing issues, I'm not going to go into it. I mean, the financing issues are absolutely key. Um, and, uh, and unless and until uh, countries are able, all countries and not just developed countries, all countries are able to mobilize the resources that are needed to build strong and universal systems, I think this is going to be um, a challenge. And, and we need global cooperation for that. You know, it's no use telling countries go and 
mobilize your own resources when because of the way that the global economy is set up they have difficulties capturing you know getting taxes because those who can who must be paying taxes with high incomes uh, global capital you know they're able to escape and not pay taxes so taxes fall on um the uh, disproportionately on those who can least afford them so there has to be i think you know global cooperation to really be able to support all countries to mobilize the resources that they need in order to build the systems that are going to be solid and universal. So that's really important. And secondly, I think uh, the point that was raised by by um, by Corinna and and I think which is very much part of a, a feminist take on these issues, is that mobilizing and globalizing um, and having very strong movements that are able to claim rights, push for policies. Uh, make sure that systems are in place that guarantee social protection as a right to everyone uh, and that can make uh, complaints when systems don't work are the other side of the coin that is absolutely uh, important. Then, you know, you have to be able to hold governments to account. And for that, you need strong mobilization from society and movements, trade unions, um, women's movements, feminist feminist organizations have a big role to play in this. Um, and I'm sure other, other uh, speakers can say more about that. But I think I'll stop here for now. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic. So we're now getting on to our final presentation before we have um, a respondent, but um, I'm handing over to Laura Alfers. Laura is the director of the Social Protection Programme at Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, in short, Vigo. Um, she has worked on social protection there since 2009 and also worked on several grassroots action uh, projects and most intensively in South Africa and Ghana. Uh, so a lot of uh, varied expertise. We're really excited to hear from you, Laura. Over to you. Thanks, Maureen. I'm going to share my screen because I have a presentation. Um, thanks to Shara and Karina for their uh, excellent sort of macro overviews. Oh, I shared and then I stopped sharing. Uh, let me just share again. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit more micro. Um, and I think part of the, the story is that actually we do need to be connecting the macro with the microeconomics uh, more. You know, we hear a lot about um, how this is going to, you know, impact informal workers and women. And we've um, we've heard, you know, that, that that was the hypothesis right from the beginning. And I think what's interesting now is that we're starting to get fairly robust microeconomic data emerging to support to support uh, what were initially hypotheses. Um, and so I thought today I would look at some new data that's emerged um, from South Africa, which has really analyzed the impact of the lockdown in South Africa in April. Um, on informal workers. It comes out of the University of Cape Town, uh, the National Income Dynamics Survey. Um, but some of my WeGo colleagues have been have been working to analyze the data. I think um, it shows some pretty stark impacts on informal workers versus formal workers and on women in particular. Um, and so it compares um, what's happening in April, uh, which was the full lockdown, with the pre-lockdown period of, of February. And this is looking at people who still consider themselves employed um, in April, so not those who lost jobs. Uh, and, and we know in South Africa from this data that um, about two thirds of the people who lost their jobs were women, uh, although they make up only 50% of the labor force. Um, this this graph shows the, the sort of, this, impact on informal versus formal workers. And this is looking at people who were locked out of employment, were unable to work um, during April. Uh, we see that informal workers suffered um, disproportionately more than formal workers. So the total is in blue. Um, and uh, informal workers about just over 30% reported that they were unable to work versus 26% in the in the formal economy. But what's what's really striking is that is the green bar, which is that in both the formal and the informal economy, it's women who are suffering um, this uh, at, a, at a much greater rate than men. And I think this is the story of this data is the gendered differences. As, as Shara pointed out, um, it's impacted on different groups differently, and the South African data is very strongly showing 
uh, how women have been impacted. Um, again, these are the gender differences in earnings in the informal economy in February versus April. So on the left, you've got the February graph, and on the right, you have the April graph. Um, the red line is women, and the blue line represents men's earnings. And what's important about this graph is the change in the distance between the two lines. Um, and you'll see that the distance is greater. Uh, in April, which shows that the gender gap in, in earnings in the informal economy has increased. Um, so, so men were able to, although there was a decrease in earnings, they were able to, to keep up earnings at a, at a much greater proportion um, than women, women were able to do. And it's great to have this data for the informal economy specifically because it's, it's, it's not often that you get such, such detailed analysis of what's happening in the informal economy specifically. The other story is the um, decrease in weekly hours worked between February and April. And again, you can see that it's women um, who decreased, had decreased hours of almost 50% um, compared to men who are sitting at about 25% between February and April. Um, and it's also self-employed workers in the informal economy um, who were hit the hardest in this respect. Uh, versus casual and, and then closely followed by casual workers. And obviously self-employment in the informal economy is something that is that is is often dominated by by women. And when you're self-employed, a decrease in the amount of hours that you've worked in general means a decrease in the amount that you've earned. Um, and so it's not surprising to see that within informal self-employment, uh, between February and April, you see a huge decrease in earnings for women um, of, of the medians. If we look at the medians on the right, um, which is the typical worker, you see the typical woman self-employed worker lost almost 60, almost 70 percent of income um, over April. So that is that is a huge, a huge impact. On, on earnings and and is quite significantly um, greater than the impact on male uh, earnings. Also interesting is that um, the the differences in care reported care work that came out. So sixty five percent of women in informal employment reported spending more time in April taking care of children, um, and that was compared to fifty eight percent of men. Um, amongst the whole sample, 80% of women who reported spending more time on childcare were reporting spending an increase of four hours a day more on childcare. And this obviously has to do with the closure of schools and early childhood uh, care centers as well as creches. Um, uh, it was in particular uh, women informal employees um, who reported an increase in their care responsibilities. So 70% of women and formal employees versus only 50% of men reported an increase in the care, care responsibilities. And this was also the single largest group who reported zero working hours during the month of April. So there's some quite clear linkages between who was able to work, uh, how much time they were able to spend working, and care responsibilities, uh, increase in care responsibilities. Um, and it, it did lead the authors of the report to suggest that uh, at least part of the uh, decrease in, in women's earnings and time that they were able to spend at work was, was due to increased care responsibilities. The fact that we are now in South Africa opening up the economy but have just closed schools again um, is, is not going to do anything to improve the situation. I think when it comes to going back to the more macro issues, what it means for an economic recovery for women and formal workers, I think Karina's point that public policy needs to articulate better with what is happening on the ground, with what movements are doing on the ground, um, take seriously the, the kind of care that is going on at the grassroots and support that is really important. Um, part of that as well is, is representation, ensuring that organizations of informal workers, particularly those led by women, are included in policy dialogue spaces when they are negotiating economic recovery plans. Um, as, as Shara pointed out, the extension of social protection over a longer term 
um, is going to be really important considering the income losses that are happening. And the, um, also the importance of ensuring that some of that social protection goes towards supporting women's care responsibilities um, because it's, you know, that is clearly taking a large chunk out of their, their income earning capacity. And not a lot of the so emergency social protection responses we've seen, there are exceptions, have specifically taken into account uh, women's care responsibilities. In some countries, in, in Namibia, the fact that you are a recipient of the child support grant actually excluded you from access to um, the special, the, you know, the sort of base COVID-related grant. So in some cases, there were penalties. Um, for already having access to, to care-related social protection. I think another priority is for child um, greater public spending on childcare provision, um, on early childhood development facilities and creches. The, the discourse around uh, work and care support is, is still very much dominated um, by the idea of formal workers in formal workplaces. Um, when it when it does come up and and i think that this crisis is a real chance to highlight the fact that actually economies don't work without care responsibilities being supported and in the case of informal workers the, the state is going to have a huge role to play in that so increased public spending and then i think understanding that the informal economy is not just a heterog you know homogenous mass there are different sectors in the informal economy we have domestic workers we have home workers waste pickers, and that each of them has their own economic dynamics um, and that, that you know, they, they need to be understood in those sectoral ways and that economic recovery packages need to be designed to account for them. I did just want to highlight some of the campaigns um, that WeGo has been helping to coordinate. This is the Two Billion Strong Recovery Starts With Us, um, which brings together all of the international networks of informal workers who are affiliated to um, WeGo, and it's the first time that all of these networks have actually come together with a joint platform, uh, which we have up in multiple languages, the Global Solidarity Platform. Um, there are also individual membership-based organization campaigns um, going on at regional and national level. Um, and we are helping to, to highlight those. The, the hashtag, uh, the our recovery starts with us and essential not exploited, obviously in, in multiple languages. I uh, also secondly wanted to highlight our childcare campaign. Um, we feel that, that especially when it comes to the informal economy, not enough attention is paid to the crucial, crucial role um, that public childcare can play in, in supporting women's incomes. Um, and, and I wanted to to just let you know that our campaign materials are also available in multiple languages and we are moving towards really supporting um, uh, organizations of workers who are uh, supporting care provision for their members in the coming few years. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, great presentation and great findings. I liked what you said about the informal economy not being homogeneous, so obviously um, we need to make it very context specific. And you also mentioned that um, public policies really need to reflect and take into account what's happening on the ground. Um, I wonder whether you have any um, suggestions on how to do that, how to make the link between the micro and the macro you've been referring to. Um, I know you've mentioned increased support for women's care responsibilities and public spending on early childhood development, but is there anything on how to bridge the gap in a way um, that we work together with multiple stakeholders and join those like dots? I mean, I think it's been said here by both Karina and, and Shara that, that actually, I, I feel like a lot of public policy attention does not take the grassroots seriously enough. And it's easy to say we should be facilitating participation and multiple stakeholders. It's not so easy to actually make that a reality. And I think that is what we spend a lot of our time doing at WeGo is trying to create the bridge um, between people who are doing the work on the ground and, and policymakers, because there's actually a need for translators 
Um, it's it's not always obvious that that an organization working to provide relief for informal workers are going to be able to speak the same language um, as as policymakers who are who are putting in place the policies. Um, so I mean I think that there's there's a need to to establish spaces for dialogue and communication between governments, but that are very carefully structured in a way that actually allows grassroots organizations to exercise voice. Um, and, and I think that's, that's sometimes harder than it seems, but I think it's, it's a worthwhile thing to be investing resources into. Um, and and um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that brings us to our uh, respondent to join up those dots of what we've heard and kickstart the discussion and then hand over to all of you. Um, Nancy Kachingwe is an independent policy and advocacy strategy advisor at South Feminist Alternatives. And Nancy supports mainly NGOs on policy analysis and adds the feminist political economy perspective to that, which is based in Zimbabwe. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Nancy. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Dawn. Um, thank you, the Women's Working Group um, and hosts of this meeting, um, giving me the, um, the task of responding to uh, a set of presentations that were excellent and uh, that I agree with everything on. So I, <laughs> I, will, I will have to uh, just try and maybe Push, uh, push the boundaries of, uh, of reflection around some of these points a little bit further. Um, and there are plenty of questions I'm seeing. Uh, so I, I hope my job will still not be uh, too difficult. I, I definitely agree with Corina's uh, uh, point um, to start off with that uh, it's not about building back better, but building forward. I would add to that, that, that let's have the slogan, another normal is possible. Um, for for the coming um, for the planning and the and the and the rebuilding, so uh, we can take our old uh, slogans uh, from before. I would like to just um, let us think about so so the the term social reproduction is often used um, is often used uh, alongside the the notion of chair, of care uh, more and more. So uh, using them both together, sort of care and social reproduction systems, um, one of the things that we need to think about is the erasure of these two systems in terms of policy thinking, financial planning, um, uh, eco economies and what economies are, value what's and what's not value. We have, um, if we think of it in, the, in terms of, say, uh, three systems of reproduction for the purposes of the discussion, we, we talk a lot about the reproduction of nature. This is the moment where we're talking about climate change um, and the, the need to preserve ecosystems. So there's a, a lot of awareness about that. Um, much higher up on the hierarchy is the reproduction of profit and the reproduction of capital. So um, that is the paramount one. It's a big monster. It insists on reproducing itself. Um, and, but, but that's what we talk about when we're talking about growth um, and, and so forth, particularly in the neoliberal sense. And then we, we have the, the reproduction of humans. And often the discussion around the reproduction of humans is simply limited to biological reproduction, abortion, anti-abortion, um, maternal uh, health. But the, the social reproduction of humans, so once, once we've given birth, which often is already a problematic set of issues, um, what it is required for human beings um, to thrive from their tiny little baby stages all the way to, well, when they die even. <laughs> um, so because we, we, we still take care of each other um, after death. So there's a massive social system of uh, or, or social reproduction system, which, which is covered by very much by issues of, of care um, and unpaid, unpaid labor. And even I have to admit that the whole 
it's it's one of those care is something that it's so much taken for granted. Is this really a thing? Of course, your mother is going to look after you. Um, of course, people are going to breastfeed their babies. When they don't, it's a big problem. But you go to school, you learn about environment, you learn about the economy, you learn about certain things. But do you, do we really think about what um, what these care and social reproductive systems are? And so I, I just want to highlight that point because I think one of the first things we need to think we need to understand is that for many in, in many systems there's been this huge erasure of care and social reproductive system, um, reproduction systems as requiring their own um, set of their their own set of thinking um, and and it takes time for us to get to the point even even those of us who are lumped with domestic work from quite early on. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, for this erasure is because if it's possible to devalue it, um, it's possible to make people to work for free. Um, the other monster, the reproduction of capital is accelerated and expanded because there's one less thing that you have to pay for. Um, so we can, uh, not pay for environment, uh, not have to pay for the cost of keep maintaining the environment, and have to pay very little for the for the um, the cost of maintaining human beings that are going to thrive, um, and then the profits just shoot up. So um, just to just just to think about that as that 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 issue that we that the why is it not valued and how do we bring it back into the center and how do we create the consciousness that that um, there's an that this is a whole system upon which human life is dependent but that we don't think about in as serious it's women's issues or or social policy but it's not serious um, it's not serious policy um, work like uh, investments in GDP um, then maybe just to go on to the points being raised around um, the economy and the financing, particularly since this is uh, financing for development ish uh, uh, discussion, um, and we have many groups in the women's working group that spend quite a lot of time um, so it, within the UN context um, that are working on the, the, the big uh, UN agendas on financing for development. Um, if we start already with the questions of um, macroeconomic policy um, and uh, financing, uh, financing for development, it, within a, a, the, skewed in, the skewed financial architecture already erases so many, um, so many, uh, so many, so much of the value that is put in, um, and so the, the there's a skewed distribution of wealth on the one hand, a non recognition of what goes into creating value, and then on the other end, a very skewed distribution of wealth. And we have these care systems that are um, sitting in between one that requires support but not getting it from one end, but is constantly having to put in because of of the depletion of of finance and support um, to, uh, uh, towards that. And, and, and the financial architecture of where, where money goes, where funds goes, how wealth is accumulated and extracted is, is a key issue that we need to, um, to think about. And I think Shara went into that quite, um, quite extensively, mentioning also um, the, uh, the, the, the role of the multilateral uh, the, the international financial organization, uh, international financial institutions, so World Bank, IMF, um, and WHO, and a, a group, a bunch of other sort of informal clubs like the G20 and the G7, that are also or the World Economic Forum, that are also these places where um, ideas are, are thought up and decisions are made, and, and policies and futures are being futures are being are being shaped. But in that context, again, um, when we're talking about building a healthy economy, another problem that we then have is how is care perceived within that, within that financial system? And the insistence always is that care, social reproduction, health, these are drains on the public purse. It's a cost. So this, these percep the perception that this is a 
this is a cost and a drain on the economy and that using taxpayers' money um, for, um, for health, uh, for education, for ch child's, um, child care. I mean, nurseries are sort of one of the, the most privatized <laughs> areas and yet they're so essential and about 50% of women cannot work at all. Um, never mind being underpaid because they have to they have to be the child care um, so there again we have uh, there again we have issues around like how how are how are how are questions of value perceived and countered within macro macroeconomic system uh, systems but we have also a general failure of the international financial institutions um, not not just in terms of finding just and creating just and equitable development finance systems, but also creating um, financial stability, which is really their mandate, which they're, they're not managing at all. Um, and then also creating fair rules of the game in terms of trade and investment to um, uh, to to ensure that there's a, an equitable distribution of, of, of funds between North and South. So just to finalize, um, understanding um, the, the devaluing what we have now is a trend. What we've seen and the reality of, of what has the pandemic has shown us is not the, only the devaluing of unpaid care work, but the consistent, persistent trends of the um, of the devaluing of paid care and social reproductive work, which is feminized. And that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why it's poorly paid is it's because women are doing that work. Um, so it's not the, the nature, if men were doing that work, it would be better paid. The fact that women are doing it is actually the reason why it there's a there's a there's a space to to be able to devalue that work further and, and, and give and have gender pay gaps and so forth. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a lot of the points and inspiration for this comes from a statement on investing in the care economy for a just green feminist COVID-19 response, which um, a lot of people signed onto, uh, but it was a group of uh, feminist organizations, some of them in this group, um, also uh, trade unions, public services, international that laid out an agenda, particularly looking at all these various issues. Um, so I would just like to mention um, that I have been poaching quite a lot of points from other people's other feminist work that has preceded us. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, amazing summary. And um, feel poaching is okay. You've given it like the great feminist spin. And I loved your um, putting in context um, the understanding of growth that this is a reproduction of profit and capital and that um, the yeah, recognition of value and then distribution of wealth is somewhat skewed. Um, I also uh, remarked your um, description of seeing unpaid care as a cost or drain to the economy rather than the benefit that it truly is and that it should be remunerated. Um, one question for you uh, before we move on to um, the discussion. Um, how would you recommend um, to integrate a better understanding of the value that um, women bring to the economy and how would you recommend to integrate a really strong focus on gender justice and women's perspective throughout financial policies? I know it's not an easy question, but uh, just to get us started um, our thinking. In, in the tradition of all labor struggles, the only way to get labor valued higher by capital or by the system is to withdraw it. Um, so ideas like women's global strikes, um, are, I think, are the direction to go. At the moment, we have one Mother's Day once a year on a Sunday where we already have days off. They can't even give us a weekday off um, to say how much they love all the work mothers do. Uh, we have an International Women's Day that was an International Women Workers Day in terms of like addressing questions of um, uh, uh, women, women in in with it, well in in the labour market, um, and that has even lost its um, worker and labour rights 
history and background. So it's all like, oh, women are lovely, and you know. Uh, um, so 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 I think claiming whether it's taking demanding more days off public holidays, um, going on strike. I know these are difficult issues, but I actually am just going to throw in the most provocative idea I can right there because we have tried persuasion, we have given data, we have given evidence, all the great studies that um, is from the speakers before mentioned those, um, and it then comes to the point where you just refuse to work. Thank you. Quite an activist understanding. Amazing. Um, so thank you, everyone, um, for your great presentations. And thanks to all um, participants um, who have posted in the YouTube chat. I am trying to do the discussion justice. Uh, apologies if I forget anything in advance. Um, it's uh, quite a juggle, but we've got um, a general comment which I uh, would like to start with, and that is that we shouldn't be talking about building back, but about building forward, because we really need to recognize um, a more equitable um, system and get that in place and realize that the old system hasn't really worked for women. Um, then there were a couple of questions on unpaid care for our speakers. Um, uh, one is linked to who should pay for care issues um, or who should pay for social protections and other public issues. And we've already heard in some of the presentations about the dangers of too much loan funding and uh, the debt burden that then arises from that. But um, it would be great to hear from our panelists um, on that. Um, the second uh, question was around specific recommendations for care policies and the recognition that um, some civil society organizations have been demanding that for years. But um, which policies on care would you recommend specifically and how to integrate this um, flexible, diverse, um, adapting to emergency rationale that has been so eloquently um, been presented. Um, there was a lot of thanks for reinforcing public funding for public systems. Um, but um, moving on to social protection, third question. Um, are there any views on this global fund for social protection? And um, a more a tricky question on social protection is um, how could you take this um, financing and this um, starting point where um, the IMF and the World Bank and other international financial institutions have started with shorter term um, social protection measures to really make that work for the longer term. Um, a comment from an ActionAid colleague um, here that uh, understaffing and austerity is a really huge problem and um, might be linked to um, the IMF's um, conditionalities and um, imposing on public sector wage containment. So um, some recommendations on how to move forward on that. And then I have one final one um, directed at Rigo asking um, where are the spaces where you think um, we should move to when it comes to demands um, from the community? think they apply more or less to um, all of our great speakers because you've touched on all those issues. Um, can I ask you to keep your replies short, two minutes, so we can still wrap up and um, I can use my role for a final question, please. Who would like to start? We need to build forward um, questions around care, who should pay for care issues and public issues, um, which specific care policies, um, what about this global fund for social protection, and how can um, investment from the international financial institutions contribute to a better longer term social protection response? I can start by saying that uh, this question about who pays uh, for the building forward uh it's it's a key question and have been in a way or another uh, brought up in all the all the presentations and in many comments uh, and i think the the issue here is about redistribution and that's why i previously said uh, taxes and illicit financial flows and 
tax on wealth and on corporations are also care issues, are also uh, employment issues. Uh, but I think that uh, beyond thinking about how we can redistribute, how we can make those who have been gaining so much in this uh, financial capitalism pay their bill, uh, we also need to, to wonder about distribution, not only redistribution. We need to redistribute because the way we distribute first is very unfair. So I think this brings us to the, to the very systemic question about how we are organizing production, how we are organizing consumption, and then what is the result in terms of distribution. And from the feminist economics perspective, we have been saying uh, for a long time that we need you know, to take markets out of the center and, and to put the sustainability of life in the center, I think that is the way to go. How can we uh, build forward a different way to, to produce, which aim is to, to, to support life, not to support profits, not to support capital accumulation. Uh, so it's a systemic question. And uh, for that, I think uh, social mobilizing is very, very relevant, as, as Shara already put it. And also, uh, governments are there to, to also make changes. But what we also need is for people to be in the governments and not for, you know, private interests to be there. So I think there is a whole issue of, again, democratizing institutions and to to take people's voice to the center of 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 power thank you so much corina i can see all the others nodding um but uh, who would like to run that um i can i can come in just to say that i guess building on what corina has said um i mean part of part of the kind of building forward and building back better really has to be um, recognizing what makes our economies tick. Uh, who's actually contributing to our economies? You know, who are the essential workers? Um, we've seen from the number of informal workers who've been classed as essential workers, even though they're provided with absolutely no protections, that, that many, many of these informal workers are actually not um surplus to requirements of the capitalist system as they are sometimes positioned to be actually they're very much um very very central to it and and that that needs to be recognized and needs to be remunerated properly and we need to have you know conversations about decent working conditions in the in the informal economy um and that includes for, for informal care workers as well and um, so on a on a Big picture point. I would, I would just wanted to emphasize that. I do think on care and at, again at a very micro level, much more attention to be paid to things like the set guidelines for the safe opening of creches and early childcare centres, um, because I don't think that enough attention is being paid to the issue of childcare in the discussions outside of the, the sort of formal global north kind of discussions that we hear. Uh, when it comes to low-income countries, I think there's a lot of assumptions about that the family is going to pick up on care responsibilities or that women are going to just change their working patterns. As we see from the South Africa data, yes, women change their working patterns, but they pay a penalty for that. Um, and the extended family is not picking it up necessarily. So, um, you know, there's, there's big issues around, like, first of all, public investment in care support. And secondly, like, actually, you know, and in South Africa, I would say, it's also about recognizing that if people are relying on creches, many of those creches are informal creches. And what are we going to do as a government and as a, as a society to, to help those creches conform with the guidelines um, that need to be in place? So, again, at a micro level. Um, I think on the question of spaces, I mean, for, for us, uh, we've done a lot of thinking about where the spaces are and really the, the difference is going to be at national level. The difference that informal workers are going to feel is by getting involved in spaces which allow them to talk to their governments. And, and we can say that over and over again, but it's not simple. I was in a, a meeting of the South African Tripartite Committee um, 
informal workers are represented through the community constituency. We have a, a three plus one tripartite committee, so a quad, quadruple committee. Um, and, you know, business was represented there and they were well represented. They could make inputs. Uh, labor, formal labor was there. They could make inputs. The community constituency, m many people didn't have enough data, weren't able to connect with the issues because they hadn't been prepped around what it was about. So actually the dialogue excluded many of them. And that's what I mean by saying, how do we create spaces that actually give people voice? And how do we, you know, how do we create those enabling conditions for voice? Thanks. Thank you so much. Moving on to the Global Protection, Social Protection Fund. Shara, is that one you would take? Yeah, I can definitely say a word about that. But before that, I do want to pick up on a couple of points that were made, uh, if I can. Uh, one, I, I, I must say, I enjoyed all of our um, the co-panelists' presentations. I mean, they were really excellent. But I do want to pick up, in particular, Nancy, you provided us with a really big picture kind of analysis of social reproduction, and the way in which uh, sort of within the capitalist system this takes place. And I do want to pick up on one point though. I think on the point that in a way, I think this is the way when the social system and social reproduction doesn't work, it does bring the capitalist system to a halt. And I think this particular crisis is a very good illustration. When in recent history have governments purposefully stopped the economy at such huge cost to everyone, including you know, including to capital. And the reason was because we had a crisis that was not a financial crisis, it was a health crisis, it was a pandemic. So I think it just goes to show that actually society matters when social reproduction doesn't work, economies can be sometimes even brought to a halt. The reason the economy was brought to a halt was to reduce the number of deaths. No one, no government wanted to have so many deaths on their hands, if, if I can use that phrase. So, you know, there was a real purpose behind this bringing down of the economy and, and stopping the economy. And in, in a less kind of dramatic way, you know, when your social reproduction system doesn't work and you have very low fertility rates, as has happened in several uh, par countries in East Asia, we see governments get all desperate because they have below replacement fertility. And they ask themselves, you know, how come, how come women are not having more babies, you know? So social reproduction, when it doesn't work, it does actually make a difference and it does bring policy response. So I think we, I mean, I think there is, a, there is an issue there. It's not always recognized as such, but it is an issue. You know, when governments complain, how come children are not, you know, getting enough of education and they're wild and there's all these teenage, you know, problems and violence and whatever, you know, that is an outcome of a society that has issues and social reproduction system that is producing issues and problems. And, you know, governments get affected and have to respond to that. I think when social reproduction works and when our care policies and social policies work, you don't see, um, you know, those costs are not there. But governments should recognize that when, then, when they don't invest sufficiently in those systems, there are costs down the line which can paralyze the economy. It could be because of high rates of crime. It could be because of, um, you know, below replacement fertility. It could be because of a pandemic that gets completely out of control and your health system cannot cope because you didn't invest enough in it or, you know, you don't have the right conditions to be able to control the pandemic. So I think there is there is that issue there that is worth recognizing at least mm -hmm. um, as something which I think this crisis made clear. And I think the points that everyone was saying about um, the issues around financing, uh, I totally agree with, with what was said. And I think just to sort of put it uh, put it in, in, in the broader frame, I think the problem is that those who should be paying because of the way in which our economies have been globalized and the way in which finance is globalized, you know, finance has an exit option. And even now there's a lot of pressure from uh, powerful institutions to say we should do away with contributory social insurance systems because it's a drag on you know job creation which does not have much support you know by research that's not the case social insurance and social contributions are one way in which capital contributes to social reproduction um so doing away with that and promising everyone a little benefit at the end you know a so-called you know um, universal benefit which may not even materialize because we don't have the kind of taxes to pay 
decent uh, universal uh, basic incomes, I think uh, is is not going to hold. And and you need and you need to have a financial system that allows uh, that doesn't only force people who are on salaried income to pay taxes, but also taxes mobile capital. So and that's why we need the global to also be. Um, part of the picture. I agree with you, Laura, completely. And I, I think it was Laura who said that. A lot of things happen at the national level. We need to have, you know, more of WIGOs and more organization of workers doing social dialogue, real social dialogue at the national level. But given the globalized system in which we live, we also need changes at the global level. And that's why I think it's really important to get also the global system right. You know, we have to work at multiple levels. And this problem of you know, illicit financial flows and for countries not being able to raise enough resources domestically is a problem because of all the loopholes and gaps and um, how do you say exit options that exist for capital. Uh, and that's something that can only be addressed at the global level. Sorry. All right, I, I, I'm interrupting here. Gosh, it, it's such a passionate discussion and I wish we could go on forever. Um, we're probably going to go over uh, for a couple of minutes for uh, final statements um, and I'll also summarize. But first, um, Nancy, um, your responses to the questions before I wrap up. Hi, I, I see one question from Prianti. Um, hi, Priyanti. <laughs> Long time. If we're looking at another possible normal, should we not try to build the economy around care um, and centering social reproduction? Uh, and, and yes, uh, if I didn't make that clear enough in my presentation, I would like to say it 100 times over. But part of the part of the part of what I was trying to emphasize was was. It has to count politically for it to be factored into policy. And I think the problem is it's it, the, the, the political importance of care. At the moment, care is sort of seen as a, as, as a social norm issue. So, oh, you know, uh, you know those, those, those people in Africa make their women work so hard and carry things on their on, and, and you know, so it's it's social norms, it's tradition. So those who are more backward may are, are terrible, you know, put more of a labor burden than you know the more progressive ones. All of it being very racialized and geography geography <laughs> located as well. So if we if we can make care not just a political but a political economy issue, we start then putting it into the realm of the economic the macroeconomic um, and macro policy and that's the thing and even within you know as women's movements as women's rights movements as feminists it, we know even going to speak to our own families to say you know this is this is not normal <laughs> you know this is an unnormal we, we, we even have to start conversing at a, a very community level for people to have an awareness that there is an injustice that's happening here it doesn't have to be this way this is not just it, it, love and duty and care if you refuse if, if you say you know I should be recognized and, and um there has to be a fair exchange. So I think I think that and then you put it into the economic system. But I think we have to not be shy. We have to be very brazen, be very loud. Um say that you know we are the ones who are making the, the point in at this stage especially is to not lose ground on the point that has been demonstrated because otherwise it, it it policy could start running away from us we have to actually say that look let's be clear this system cannot work without us and we want to see justice in terms of this imbalance in terms of what we are putting in and what we are getting out and then I think maybe just one last point, the safety net, social protection, and a, 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 a new deal for care. You know, I think not just beyond social protection. We're talking about a green new deal for the environment and the economy. We have to talk about the new deal type of um, issue that takes all the full scope of care work um, beyond just social reproduction. Let's be more ambitious. And let's also make sure that these new deals everyone is talking about has a care, a proper, proper care deal within it. The expansion, I think, like Karina was talking about when she uh, started in her in her presentation. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, what an amazing discussion. I'm, I'm sad to uh, have to wrap it up now, but this is just the starting point and there are other webinars to follow and I'm sure Rosa and Ale will um, let us know in a sec, but I'm going to use this to wrap up quickly and just whiz through the breadth of issues we've touched on um, today. And then I have one final question for the panelists. So we talked about um, care, the care system, and um, that it really is a social responsibility rather than a cost and that it has to matter politically to get it right because we need to build back better um, or build forward as was said in the chat box as well and um, when it comes to the care system there were um, good statements on this requiring better government policy so it's within the public sector remit but it also needs to bring in community arrangements and um, draw from local expertise um, and at the just recovery um, care really is at the center and um, investment in social infrastructure and um, public services is really at the se center of a gender equitable recovery or building back equal um, we talked about um, working conditions that they're inadequate and um, we heard about the irony in a way of relying really heavily on essential workers and women and girls to to keep societies going um, yet uh, there is uh, there are no appropriate um, safety nets or even better social protection or any appreciation of of the value um, that's brought to keeping life afloat um, when we moved on to social protection, um, there was a mention that um, I think in a short amount of time, a couple of weeks, 1,200 measures of social protection schemes were put in place, but they are rather um, short term, even though they have extended coverage, including informal workers and migrants, they're short term and we're now at a, and I quote, critical juncture um, to bounce back and recover much better. And that requires investing in health and public care services and really requires longer term social protection. And that is universal social protection, universal health coverage. And I, I love this quote about safety nets uh, really leave holes. So we need social protection floors and financing um, for universal social protection. Then we moved on to the informal economy and uh, looking at all those issues um, that becomes obvious that this isn't a unified homogeneous mass but that um, it requires a nuanced response. Um, we're needing public policies that highlight um, much better what's happening on the ground and really take on board local expertise. We heard that we need to really start um, taking grassroots and feminist organizations and movements seriously and not only talk about it and really create the bridge between policymakers and all this amazing expertise um, that local movements bring grassroots feminist organizations and create the space for meaningful dialogue oh. and communication and then um, I, I really liked this putting together joining of the dots on um, that there's this huge recognition of value and then distribution of wealth. We heard reproduction of profit and capital is really at the center of our current understanding of growth. We need to re we need to correct that and um, then we heard like quite an inspiring way of yeah claiming the streets if we really want to integrate a better understanding of value maybe we need to go on strike maybe there's something about asking for better remuneration and um, I like this final point you made Nancy I think there was some um, society matters obviously and this system can't really work without um, us and it really can't work without women's and girls uh, contributions to society and the economy so um finishing off i'm gonna give the last word um to the panel and i have uh, one quick question um for you you've got about 30 seconds to answer that can you give me one priority that you think matters what needs to be done to recover better build forward go <laughs> i'm gonna shall we follow the the order so um Let's start with you, Corina. Being in a pandemic, I, say, I think that the key priority is to stay safe. And for that, we need care. So I think the, the main priority is to speak up on the need of creating, a, maybe we can say a caring 
economy, an economy that cares for, for people. Over to you, Shara. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, well, to follow, to follow, Corinna said what we need to have as the priority, which was to make sure the economy is caring for everyone. Uh, and I would say make finance serve that purpose. Finance should be in order to enable the economy to provide social protection and care for everyone and not to serve the very narrow interests of those with Thank financial you. capital. Laura? Uh, really just to, I guess, not only recognize the contribution of the many informal workers who are out there, many of them providing the essential services that we need to survive, um, but also to recognize the work of their organizations in, in helping relief measures and emergency measures get to the ground to be the last mile responders and, and, to, and to start valuing the idea of a popular organization on the ground and, and how we link, as Karina said, our public policy with, with what is happening on the ground. Thanks. Thank you. Last but not least, Nancy. You're on mute still. Nancy, you're still on mute. Can you unmute yourself? I said that's not fair. Because <laughs> I have everyone else has put their priorities. <laughs> um, I agree. Show us the money, uh, recognize the work that um, everyone is doing, and mobilize. So I've summarized them all and added one more word. Thank you. And I'm going to add to that um, from a uh, carer's perspective. I think it's really key if we want to build back um, equal and um, build forward that we really prioritize um, women and girls uh, in the response. And there's no better way to do that by ensuring that women co-lead and shape the response and recovery initiatives. So um, with that, Thank you so much for this amazing discussion and inspiring webinar. I'm going to hand back to Rosa and Alejandra. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic panel. I am thrilled and so proud of all of you. Um, my one takeaway is my favorite hashtag is another normal is possible. So um, on behalf of my co-convener, Emilia, and myself and co-organizers, um, Ale, thanks to our fabulous panel, Corina, Shara, Laura, Nancy, and bravo um, to our moderator, Maureen. Um, Ale, I don't know if you want to say a few thank yous at this point. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you for, for joining us, for, you know, your, your generosity, uh, for, you know, providing all the inputs that you have. I think there's a lot to digest. Um, I think that there's a lot to be done, as you said, to build better forward and especially talking to other movements. I'm thinking of all the men, all the movements in trade unions, in peasants, in other movements, climate justice movements, um, business and human rights movements that we need to enchant with these messages. And for that, I also reiterate the invitation. Tomorrow there is a don't talk on COVID and the special case of Kerala. Uh, so please, um, you know, if you want, you can see all the details in Don website. And this this work will continue. Thank you very much, Women Working Group, Emilia and Rosa. Thank you. And just thank you, Ale and Corina and Don for this partnership. And a big kudos, big thanks to our amazing technical and support teams. You're wonderful as always. Our next webinar on global processes, systemic issues, and the future of humanity is in two weeks, August 12th. So thank you again. Stay safe, stay healthy, be well, and mobilize. Thank you. <laughs>